The Wizard's Boy by Nancy Varian Berberick. Dragon Magazine, 10th Anniversary Issue, number 110, published June 1986. The Venerable Ellen is dead. In the halls of the king, they have summoned the bards to sing the lay of life, to tell the tales of his many long years. What tales they will tell, I can guess. There is one, however, which they will tell and tell only part of the truth, and that is the founding tale. We have become a reverend order now. We have become wise men, counsellors, respected lords. There was a time when the title wizard was not applied to our kind. There was a time when we were labelled conjurers, fortune tellers, sorcerers, and worse. We were held in little respect and with fear. It was not then as it is now. I have seen the lifetime of two kings. We are a long-lived order. The venerable Alan had seen the reign of two more kings than I. They love him now and they mourn him. Come to me and sit close. Draw up your stools and benches. Eat your ale and find a place of comfort. The tale I would tell you is one that I know you have not heard. The tale I would tell you is one the bards chose long ago to embroider and make more suitable to these times. Are you comfortable? Is your ale warm? Listen then, and I will tell you the tale of the venerable Ellen and the wizard's boy. I did not become a wizard in the usual way. There was, in the time of my own youth, no seeking, no itinerant wizard sweeping through the villages and castles in great pomp and mystery to choose among the young children from those who might be considered for wizards' teachings. Things in my youth were very much different. There was no order. There were, at the time, but few wizards, and they were named sorcerers and spoken of with fear and scorn. First, I was a thief. I was the son of a thief, and had to my credit the teachings of a father who ended his own long career upon the gibbet. I was privileged to attend that death. It was not I who considered it a privilege, but the folk of the town who finally caught and hanged him. It was in their minds, I think, to draw for me a lesson in the ending of a thief's life. It was a harsh lesson, and one which stayed with me ever. It was not to say that I never stole again. Indeed, upon leaving behind that wretched town, I had nothing but the clothes upon my back, the frayed boots upon my feet, and the admonitions of the townsfolk to go and steal no more. But I tried. I journeyed ever with the sight of my father hanging lifeless and ruined upon the gibbet. I knew that I had wanted to face no such fate. I wanted no crossroads grave for myself. I knew as well that I was poorly equipped for any other career than thievery. We are fatalists as children. We understand the reality of life in a world where power is held by those older and larger than we. I did not wonder that I viewed my prospects with a large degree of cynicism. Still, the degree and reason for my thievery changed. I stole now only what I must. I stole when I could find no work, when I could not beg for my needs. There is no place for a homeless boy of ten years in a world which views strangers with suspicion and mislike. I made attempts at respectability. I would stop at every good-sized town or village, petition innkeepers, stablemen, shopkeepers for the work which would keep me clothed and housed and fed. I was not often successful, but I was persistent. It was not until I was certain that there would be no work for me that I stole what I needed. It was in such a village that I met Alan. My boots which had been frayed and wearing thin at the time of my father's death, had worn through and finally become useless. A morning and an afternoon of seeking employment had served to show me that there was no one in the village who would risk the presence of an unknown boy in his shop or inn. I'd begged a few scraps of food and a sip of ale from the baker's wife at the nooning, and it was nearing night now, and my belly was making known to me its need for more, and my feet were sore and gritty with dust and pebbles that had worked their way through the holes in the soles of my boots. As the sun bled and setting across the western sky, I sneaked carefully, I thought, into the back of a tanner's shop. There was a pair of soft leather boots there which would nicely fit me. The shop was closed for the evening meal, and I did not think that the tanner would soon return. I was wrong. I had the boots in my hand, 
not stopping to put them on and was sneaking my way back out through the rear of the shop when I was caught. The tanner, a big burly man, grabbed me, missed and sent out a shout which fair roused the whole of the small village. I ran, pelting through the narrow streets, the tanner and several others who had answered his cry giving chase. I tore past the baker's shop, down an alley and through the courtyard of the village inn. Dashing here and there, I made my way toward the inn, thinking to hide myself among the crowd which was surely within. There I ran up against someone, and I was caught. I thought nothing for a moment, for I was panicked. I heard my heart pounding in my ears, and surely I wheezed like a bellows for all to hear, for it had been a long run. Big hands grasped my arms. I staggered, for my knees were weak with the effort of the run and with fear, and there would be a beating, and I hoped nothing more. He shook me, not hard and not unkindly, but more to get my attention. He had it. I looked up. Behind me, the angry sounds of my pursuit faded. I knew the tanner and his friends were there, clamouring for me to be turned over to them. I had no thought for them. There was no room for thought of anything but the man who held me. He was tall and not so young and not so old. His robes were indistinct brown colour. Over those, he wore a hooded cloak of fine burgundy wool. The hood was thrown back, revealing hair of darkest black, touched in places with grey and long enough to nearly touch his shoulders. His beard was thick and glossy, with more grey in it than his hair. His face, weather-worn and craggy, spoke of travel. All this I saw while I was trapped by the grip of his eyes. They kept me with a hold far surer than the grip his hand still had upon my arms. They were black, if they could be given any colour, and they were as deep as cavern pools, running still and quiet. I looked into them, and I was lost to all around me. I felt every secret being plumbed from me. I was convinced that this man was able to see into my most inner places, and that nothing could be hidden from that dark regard. For myself, I learned nothing. That gaze which took and inspected every part of me gave nothing back. I might as well have sought to use the night sky for a window. And then he spoke. Who are you, boy? There was gentle in his voice. His eyes then revealed something a little like wonder and more like recognition. I could do nothing but answer. I told him my name, and he nodded as though I had confirmed information which had already come to him from some other source. He stole the boots! And with the tanner's aggrieved and belligerent cry, I was suddenly back in the real world. The stranger looked past me then and regarded those in the courtyard who muttered with uneasy agreement. He reached down, taking the boots which were still clutched in my hand. These? I? The tanner's tone was changing. There was a subtle undertone of fear beneath his word of agreement. He tossed them to the tanner, who was too startled to catch them and let them fall to the cobbles at his feet. They are returned. The tanner grumbled behind me and muttered of punishment. The hand still upon my shoulder turned me, and I faced my accusers. I thought then that he would turn me over to them, and I began to tremble, for I had no love of beatings. But he did not. He extended his arm so that I was enfolded in the burgundy cloak. I felt the cold nudge of the sword which sheathed at his side. I knew then that there would be no beating. The tanner looked about him for the support of his friends. There was none, for they were fading away, looking uncomfortable and making it clear that they would not press the matter. After all, the boots were returned and they had business to which they should attend. Alone, the tanner stood his ground a moment longer. His eyes went from stranger to me and widened suddenly, with something like fear or perhaps understanding. He picked up his boots and hastily left. Why did you steal those boots? I looked up at him from the haven of his cloak and shrugged. Mine are worn useless, my lord. I did not know that he could rightly claim the title, but I sensed that if he could not claim it by birth, Ah, uh, I might so name him and not be far wrong. He smiled. So, you steal? It was the only way at the time. Ah, uh, a pragmatist. I did not know what that meant, but it did not sound insulting, so I only nodded. He laughed. Where do you live, boy? Nowhere, my lord. Your parents? My father is dead this past year, my mother ten years ago. I see. He seemed to consider something, and then nodded as though he had come to a decision. He regarded me closely again, and again I felt that I was swimming in waters too deep for my skill. I began to shake and tried to stop it. I had little success. When he saw this, his smile deepened. I need a servant, but not one who will steal from me. 
I lifted my chin at that and answered far more arrogantly than I would have had I known who he was. I do not steal if my belly is full, my lord. Or if there are boots upon your feet. He was amused. I. He loosed me then, and I stepped away, but not far. He reached into the pouch which hung at his belt and took out several coins. Go buy the boots, boy. I took the coins and stared. They were twice what the boots were worth, and far more riches than I had ever held. Even so, I do not believe I would have taken them and run. All of this, my lord? The tanner will feel well paid for his trouble tonight. Buy them and return to me here. Aye, my lord. I found the tanner in his shop, alone at his workbench. He was not working, but sitting silently. I paid him with all the coins I'd been given. Yet he tried to return them, saying that the boots were not for sale. But sir, I said, puzzled by the refusal to sell his wares and by the long, suspicious looks he was giving me from the corners of his eyes, his looks made me shiver. I offer you twice what the boots are worth. Aye, and what do you offer me but Conjurer's Guild? Conjurer's Guild? These? I held out the coins. There was nothing wrong with them that I could see. They were the small square coin of the realm, marked on both sides with the sheaf of wheat which stamped them as good king's coin. No, sir, these are good. You had them of the... He stopped, shook his head once, and picked one of the coins from a hand, examining it closely. You had them of the man in the stable yard. Aye. He peered more closely at the coin. Well, it seems sound enough. Squaring his shoulders, he took the rest of the coins. Very well. Then, boy, take the boots and take something else. What then? I asked, my hands already stroking the fine soft lever of the boots, which were now mine. Take heed, boy. You throw your lot in with a conjurer. Again, I shivered. How do you know that, my lord? Seems a right enough man? Still, there was a doubt in my mind, cast there by the certainty of his own expression. He is a conjurer. We know his kind here. We know his tricks and schemes. The tanner's smile was sour. You name him Conjurer, I whispered. Aye, and that he is. Have a care, boy, that you sell your soul for more than a pair of boots for your feet. My soul? The boots grew heavy in my hand. Was that the price of footwear? I remembered his clear dark eyes, the firm, kind way in which the stranger now named Conjurer had stood for me against the tanner and his fellows. My soul? I did not think that he was bargaining for my soul. I did not think then that he was what the tanner named him. Shrugging and tucking the boots under my arm, I left the tanner to his profit. Still, the tanner's words were much with me as we began our journeys. Alan did not try to hide his identity from me, neither did he at once disclose it. It came soon enough. As he wished, I acted as his servant. He did not have a horse, so we travelled on foot. It was not long before I discovered that the tanner's warning held truth. I had fallen in with a conjurer. There was a night, not long after our association began, when we were camping in the depth of the forest. I had trapped two rabbits for our dinner. The night was chill and wet. It had been raining since the dawn of that cold grey day, and while Alan skinned my catch, I had tried to light a fire from the best of the wet wood that I had gathered. I had no success with the kindling. The sparks from my flint would leap, arc, and fall to their death upon the wet twigs and leaves. After many attempts, my hands stiff and awkward from the chill, I cursed roundly. Alan laid the meat aside, glanced up at me, and smiled from the shadows of his hood, which he had drawn over his head against the drizzle. A strong oath for a lad so young, he whispered softly. Aye, but not strong enough for the light of fire, I grumbled. It's a wet night. It might be that you ask too much of flint and tinder boy. I asked it to do only what it should. Aye, but not what it can. I sat back on my heels and tossed the flint aside with an expression of disgust. My anger was, I thought, a good covering for the disappointment which I felt at the prospect of a cold camp and no dinner. Again, Alan smiled. Let me see if I can help. I wished him luck, hunkering down upon the damp ground and watched with little hope of this fire this night. He moved closer to the ring of stones I had fashioned to contain the fire. He arranged the kindling only a little, and then took a small breath. A fire, he said softly, and I knew that he was not speaking to me. Neither, I thought, was he speaking to himself, as a man does reviewing the tasks at hand. A fire, to warm our meal, to warm our night, a fire for kindly purposes only.
It was as though he asked a boon of someone. I shivered, and the shivering had little to do with the cold or the damp. The warning words of the tanner came into my mind, and I hugged myself against the chill and the advance of fear. A fire, bright and hot. A fire for comfort. He lifted his eyes, his gaze passing over me as though I were not there. It travelled high, and I could not follow where it went. Past the heights of the trees, up to the grey and starless sky, the forest became still around us. The dripping and sigh of the drizzle seemed to fade to nothing. The soft rustle of forest creatures hunting in the night vanished. His voice was a sigh. A fire. My eyes came back to him, and I was not able to see his face now. Shadows had drifted across it, shadows which did not touch his shoulders or the rest of him. And through the shadows, I could see the light of his eyes. Words fell from his lips now, and they were words which I had never heard before, but which were, in some frightening way, familiar to me. Fur he to flama, come and hear a fortis zima te worm. Fur come and hear. The words spilled from him like silver water. It seemed to me, crouching before the lifeless fire ring, that I could see the words, feel them. It was too frightening now to even shiver. I would make no move at all which would, might call his attention to me. Furre tu flamacumen. His voice rose, loud and strong, and then fell fully away. There was no echo of his words among the forest trees. He lifted his hands then, and placed them above my little pile of kindling. He left them there, only a scant inch above the wet wood, for a long moment. And then he moved, only his hands, but the motion caught my attention and held it. He lifted his hands slowly, as though pulling them with a great weight. His fingers curled, gripping, gripping something I could not see. Fur, he said, his voice a whisper now, and strained. Fur, come in here. And it came. It came first as soft, thin tendrils of smoke, but soon the tendrils thickened and became darker, and at their roots, far down among the larger pieces of wood which I'd laid as a base for the fire, flame licked. He raised his hands higher, straining now, and the fire became two and three, and leaped triumphantly into the night. And there was fire. Slowly, I got to my feet, keeping my eyes ever upon the enchanted flame. I thought of flight, I thought of bolting through the wet forest, running until I became lost, running until he could no longer find me or my soul. But I did not run. I did not run because he fell back upon his heels, bringing his hands, the hands which had only seconds ago worked sorcery, up to cover his face. Sorcerer, I whispered. It was not an accusation, and I was sorry that it sounded like one once spoken. He dropped his hands and lifted his eyes to mine. I, I shivered. Not from cold, but from fear. I was well travelled for my ten years. For that I may thank my former career. I had the common knowledge of conjurers, tricksters, dabblers in the unknown, therefore the forbidden. My mind told me that I was in danger. The first thing a conjurer will take, the common knowledge said, is the soul. So fine is the skill that you will not realise your loss, and it is too long gone. And yet, I could see nothing evil, nothing fell, in the dark, tired eyes of the man who revealed himself as part of that suspected brotherhood. There was only Alan, tired and yet very much the same man who defended me from the grim harvest of my thievery. I listened not to my mind, but to my heart, and in the light of his fire, I could see that he was breathing differently, much like a man who had expended a great deal of effort. My lord, I asked softly, going to his side, are you unwell? He raised his hand and waved my question away gently. My lord, can I get you anything? Water? Hush, boy, he said at last. His voice was weary, but patient. He placed a hand upon my shoulder and got slowly to his feet. Ah, oh, that is better. Are you ill? This seemed to amuse him, for he smiled. Not at all, boy, only used. Used? I used. Magic's not free for the taking, boy. One must give something in return. He raised his arms, stretching muscles which were cramped and stiff. What, what do you give, my lord? He paused in his stretch, abandoned it, and came to stand beside me, hand moving down, lifting my face up to his own. I felt again the sense of falling into the depths of his gaze. I was again held by the dark eyes which had only moments ago glowed with sorcerous power. Do you seek my soul, my lord? I whispered. He did not speak for a moment, 
but seemed to be considering my words. When he did speak, his voice was coloured with amusement. <laughs> no, boy. Or perhaps, yes. I trembled now and moved away from his hand. He shook his head, his eyes softening. No, boy. I do not seek your soul to take and keep. It is only if I seek it, I seek it to show to you. My lord? Enough of this now. He shrugged his shoulders as though throwing off a burden. He took up the skinned rabbits and the sticks I had found to spit them. Are you not hungry? Our dinner has been delayed a little, but it is more than enough time to make my belly impatient. Come, spit the rabbits, and we will eat. I took the meat from him and the spits. The tanner's words seemed of no more importance to me. He was not flagrant with his skills or prodigal of them. I well knew the effort it cost him to use his magic now. Magic is not free. One must give something in return. And I wondered, as I travelled with him, what it was that Alan gave. But I never asked. I had lost the first layers of my fear. I was no longer afraid of him, but I was not comfortable with the idea of magic. I had been too well versed in the common knowledge to lose that fear very soon. He asked me once if I would like to learn his skills. No, my lord, those skills are beyond me. I smiled and shook my head. I can steal a pair of boots. Sometimes, he said with wry amusement. Aye, most times, but I would not try to steal the fire. Is that what you think I do? Steal the fire? I shrugged. Well, well, it might be an answer. From whom do you think I steal it? The gods? The gods? Aye, maybe. He smiled at that. There are no gods, boy, but those of our own making. I did not argue with him. I had little truck with gods in my own short life. Were there gods indeed? I did not know, and cared less. There was a body of gods commonly worshipped, but they had few of my petitions and had answered even less. Whatever, my lord. No, no, I have no wish to learn your skills. A pity. Could you teach me? The contrary question came almost unbidden to my lips. I would not wish to learn, I assured myself, but I was only curious to know if the power could be learned. But Alan shrugged. It does not matter, does it? You will not learn. Well, I... He could not have failed to hear the disappointment in my voice. It was obvious even to me. His careful gaze held me for a long time. He is seeking something, I thought. What does he seek when he watches me like that? Our travels took us from town to village to town, stopping at the inns and staying a few days. At night, Alan would join the folk gathered at the landlord's hearth and exchange the news of the day. He was a great gossip and loved to hear the tales and legends of the area. He had not told me what task engaged him, and I could not see that any did except the gathering of tales and the exchange of news. Sometimes I asked him where we were going, and he always answered the same. We're looking for the dragon boy. I would laugh and tell him that everyone knew there was no such creatures as dragons. They inhabited the nursery tales that women told to keep the young children behaved and certainly not the real world. He would laugh too and say that perhaps I was right. And so we visited the towns and we would sit and gossip and the nights away. He made no use of his magic and he maintained as best he could the persona of a simple traveller. But at night, by the fading light of an inn's hearth or over the embers of a dying campfire, he would watch me. I would catch sometimes the light of hope in his eyes and a careful speculation. Winter had come. I had been with Alan for more than a year, and our journeying took us less and less to the villages and towns, and in the autumn he had purchased two horses, and this surprised me, although I was not unhappy to finally ride. By the time the first snow had fallen we were in the foothills of the northern mountains, and we had not entered a village for nearly a month. We had actually passed two by, and as I saw the last one disappear behind the rocky bend of a river, I asked him again where we were bound. Seeking the dragon boy? The same answer. I began to wonder if he was serious. We travelled ever upward, farther and farther, until we lost the beeches and the birch trees and were surrounded by the hoary eaves of evergreens. The thin skin of the earth gave way to many places now to rocky bone, thrusting upward in boulders through the soil. We travelled above the tree line, and there were places where all the majesty of mountain and forest were revealed to us. After a time, we came to the places ravaged by fire. Trees were stripped and blackened. Few creatures ran to hide from us, and dinner was difficult to find. What I was able to catch was hoarded and made to last for many days. 
wrapped in my cloak one night, finishing our scant meal. I asked him what he thought must have caused the fire. Lightning, perhaps? I had asked. Would it have been known to happen that a bolt would strike a tree and the fire would spread unchecked, killing thousands of acres, hundreds of miles of trees? Alan shook his head. The dragon. I looked at him long and saw that he was in earnest. There are no dragons, I said, more to quiet my awakening fear than to refute his statement. I did not laugh this time. Neither did he. There is one, and one that guards what I seek. I looked around at the blackened forest, thinking that in the nursery tales, they told you that dragons breathed fire. I held deeper in my cloak, and I was afraid. He saw that and smiled. You need not fear, boy, for we will part company before I meet the dragon. That gave me even greater fear. Never, my lord. I'm afraid so, boy. You can be of little use to me then, and perhaps a hindrance. I would ask you to wait for me, though. For it may be, I hope it will be, that I will return and we can continue together. I was frightened. There was no covering it, and I made no attempt to hide it. I was coming to love him. It was, perhaps, that he was good to me, or perhaps a boy at that age easily loves the one that acts as a father to him. Whatever it was, I was not going to leave him. I told him this. But he would have none of it. You can journey with me a little further, then we will part company. Wait, if you will, or leave. That is your choice, boy. There was no appeal to that calm decision, and I did not speak further, but I resolved in my heart not to leave him. He told me then the purpose of his visits to the towns. He did not love the local gossip for its own sake, he said, but it was the surest way to learn the tales and legends of the area. The further north we had come, the more often did he hear tales of the dragon. It guarded something. He did not say what, but it was something he was willing to throw his life away for. Therefore, I judged it to be of great value, a treasure perhaps, or a talisman. I did not ask, for I reasoned that it must be a fearful treasure if it was worth his life to gain. We travelled for two more days at the Timberline, he silent and I inwardly stiffening my resolve not to leave him no matter how he commanded me, and then we came to the peak. It was a huge, bare place, a giant, rocky prominence, pocked with the mouths of caves, covered with scree and boulders. Not a living thing grew upon its barren sides. It loomed above us like an angry skull. It made me afraid. We were silent for a long time. He watched the peak. I watched him. I knew that he was going to dismiss me. I had my arguments, weak even as they were, prepared. He looked away from the peak. It's time, boy. No, my lord. I will not leave now. You do not have a choice. Will you tie me here then, or take my horse? He smiled. <laughs> I do not think that will be necessary. You will do as you are bid, as you always have. It has been one of your chief virtues. Here he smiled again, for we both knew that my virtues were few. How can you ask this of me? We've travelled together for more than a year, my lord. I thought I'd earned your trust. If I'd thought that the last would be a telling shot, I was mistaken. Ellen merely nodded. You have over and over again, boy. And now... I would entrust you with one more thing. To abandon you when you need me? No, you are to wait here. He reached beneath his cloak and took out the dagger which was sheathed there. In the sunlight I could see a glimmer of light along the hilt of the sword he always wore. He's mad, I'd thought then, and going against a dragon with only a sword. I said nothing, but took the dagger he held out to me. It was a beautiful thing, slim and sharp. The grip was chased silver and bore a single pale green jewel. Keep it in your boot, boy. You may need it. I want to help you. It came out more as a wail than an insistence, and I was ashamed to hear the crack in my voice. You cannot help, and would only hinder. You're going after a dragon with a sword? Where will that get you? I was angry, and my voice mocked. It will melt your sword, my lord, and then where will you be? It surprises me now, looking back, that he was so patient with me. But he was, perhaps because he understood something of my feelings. He spoke softly, his voice even and reasonable. I have more than my sword, boy. I have the magic. But I want to help. That caused him to laugh. He did not laugh unkindly, but he was surely amused. 
I was wounded. I am pleased that even now I can provide amusement, my lord. Do not be hurt, boy. You cannot help. You cannot go against a dragon. He paused then but went on. And you have no magic. I was chastened. He was right. I had no magic. And I was, after all, only a small boy. A hindrance. Should I not have turned away the opportunity to learn his magic? In my mind I knew that I would not have learned enough to be able to help him now. It must take many years of study, I reasoned. Still, in my heart, I felt the sharp fang of regret. What would you have me do? Ah, now that's better. Wait here. Wait as long as you can or dare. You'll know if I am able to return. When you decide that I cannot, you must run for your life. Run as hard as you have ever run before. For if you fail, the dragon will be out and his fury will seek victims. Run back the way you came, boy, and make your way to the king. I stared at him. To the king, my lord? It's a month's ride to the king. And once there, how will I gain entrance to see him? He nodded to the dagger he'd given me. That will be your pass to the king. He will know it well, for it was his until he gifted me with it. The king gave you this? I could not reconcile my picture of Alan the Conjurer with this Alan who was now telling me that the king himself had gifted him with a jeweled dagger. When you see him, tell him you have come from me. Tell him that I have failed. Failed in what, my lord? He will know. If he wishes you to know, he will tell you. But, but, you, but more than a ram sensing a you in heat, boy. Alan's eyes flared with a sudden anger. It is enough that you do as you are bid. Will you? I am a lord, I will. His expression grew kinder. He reached across the horses and dropped a hand upon my arm. You've been a good servant. I hope that we will leave here together. But if we do not, I know that you will do as I bid. I loved him then. Tears sprang to my eyes, and I dashed them angrily away with the back of my hand. I am a lord, I will. And truly, I thought that I would. He was satisfied. Tell the king, then, that you have studied with me. He will find a place for you. Studied with you? I've not studied with you, my lord. Thank you not. Ay, well, the king might find differently. He left me then with no further word, and I watched him go. He took his horse as far up the scree as he could and then left it. I saw him drop his hand beneath his cloak to loose his sword. Poor sword. And what good would it be against dragons? I had truly intended to obey his instructions. Partly through fear and mostly through love. But I did not. When he was far from me, nearly halfway up this peak, I started to move forward. I thought I was only going for a better look, for I was loath to stay back when I could see. I walked my horse up the scree, guiding him carefully at first and then giving him his head, leaving him alone to pick his own way. We drew even with the place where Alan had left his own mount and passed it. But soon the way was too hard and I stopped. On foot, I crept further up the rocky slope. The scree had given way to hard rock, but the path, such as it was, led straight up now. I was an active boy, and I found little difficulty scrambling for a hand and foothold where necessary. I still think that I had thought only to see. He was out of sight now, too far up for me to catch even a glimpse of him. I balanced where I was, hands clinging to a ledge above my head, feet braced against jutting rock below. There I stood when the sound came. It was a horrible noise, a trumpeting, a bugling, and a hissing all at once. The air was filled with sulfurous stink, my breath caught in my throat, gagging me with fear. I trembled in every limb and would have run back the way I came, heedless of caution, but for the sound of his cry. It was not a cry of pain or fear, but the bellowed sound of Alan's magic words, commands in that almost familiar language of power. The shrieking increased, the air about me throbbed with the stench and power. I clutched my handhold and squeezed my eyes shut. I heard his voice again, and this time it was a cry of pain. I did not think, for if I had, I surely would not have done what I did. I scrambled upward again, my mind a grey blank wall, not admitting pain or fear or hope. I simply responded to Alan's cry. The way twisted, there was no longer a path. I scrambled and climbed, clinging to rocks I never would have chosen for holds if I'd been able to think. And then I saw the dragon.
It was horrible. It was huge, and it stank like sulfur and cesspits. In the fading afternoon light, the scales of its armour reflected the golden sunlight. At its feet, small to my eyes and vulnerable, lay Alan. He did not move. Is he dead? I thought. The pain of loss ran through me. My eyes ran with tears and stung. I could not put up a hand to wipe them, for I was clinging with precarious balance to the edge of the long drop from the dragon's cave. Venom ran down the dragon's jaws. It dropped, hissing and steaming to the ground where Alan lay. Oh, move, my lord. And he did, but barely and only slowly. The beast rose above me. It was larger than my eyes could see in one terrified glance. There are words bards use to describe dragons. There are phrases they call upon uh, time after time. They tell of wide reaches of leathery wing, arched and clawed. They tell of a head larger than the body of a horse, of a neck muscled and scaled, thicker around than the largest tree in the forest. They tell of the stink of the flames which issue from the maw of such a beast. They have not seen a dragon. Had they, had they once come within sighting distance of a dragon, they would not tell of these things. They would tell instead in words which stuttered with fear of the soul-chilling terror of the beast. They would tell of the stone to which their limbs turned, while their hearts and minds screamed for flight. They would tell how every purpose, good and ill, fled their hearts, blotted out by the immense shadow of a beast which should have lived only in legend. I did not flee. I pretend no nobility of heart. I would have fled had I had the power to move, had I been able to get my paralyzed limbs to take me back down the mountain, but I could not. So I hung, shaking and weeping in my terror. Alan moved again, hunching his shoulders, gathering his breath to speak. I could barely hear his words about the dragon's steaming pant. Power to cloak. Power for strength soon. Tea banfair. His words were soft, quiet, but bore, even to my untutored ears, a power. Through the sting of my tears, through the darkness of my fear, I could see that his sword arm was bent under him in a way that no arm should bend. Power to cloak. I barely saw his lips move. His eyes were squeezed tightly shut, whether to lock out the sight of the dragon or to lock in his concentration, I did not know. Power for strength, though. He asked for strength, I thought, and wondered how I knew. It was the language of magic which he spoke, a language foreign to me, and yet so haunting and familiar. I listened to Alan's words, repeated them in my heart, and took faint strength from them. Power to ban fair. His voice was ragged and stumbling now power to banish fear. There was no lessening of the fear in my heart. Power to ban fear, I repeated silently, and there was, faintly, a softening of the terror which had turned my limbs to stone. The beast turned its head as I watched, and the flame of its breath passed above us, close enough to scorch. Power, I whispered. Power for strength. Not for me, I begged silently. Not for me, for Alan. Not breathing, not thinking of anything but Alan who lay at the feet of the death, I clambered upward, forcing my hands to grasp the crumbly shale, forcing my feet to find grips and hold them. I could barely control my limbs. Fear might have been lessened, but it was not banished. I stood upon the ledge and stumbled toward Alan. Power, I said, hearing my own voice as a weak croaking. Power to ban fair for strength. The dragon reared back again beat its wings against the sky and darted suddenly downward, fangs gleaming in the sharp light of day. Dragon! No! Dragon! I screamed. I dropped to my knees beside Alan, and he twisted toward me, his face shaped by pain to one I hardly knew. What word, my lord? What word? Yield! he grasped. Gaelden! Gaelden! I screamed. Gaelden! The dragon paused its eyes gleaming with dark hatred. Alan grasped my wrist. A spell, boy. A spell. A spell? I knew no spell. But the words I had heard him use, those which I had repeated, might be shaped into a spell, might they not? I took a long breath. Beam in power, dragon Gilden. It did not yield, but it drew back. The words arrested its dripping fangs, stilled for a precious moment that downward swoop which would have ended Alan's life. I leapt to my feet, scrambled in and under the enormous foreleg of the beast, running for Alan's sword. 
the stench of the dragon rose up and staggered me. Power to ban fair! This time my chant was supported by Alan's voice. The ground beneath my feet seemed suddenly less solid. My breath was light in my chest. My head seemed filled with a frightening kind of light and fire. I darted beneath the dragon's leg, my arm brushing against scales which felt like armour. I snatched up the sword which lay behind the leg of the beast, just below the enormous sweep of its chest. Whirling, I tossed it to Alan, who caught it, fumbling in his left hand. Spade-shaped and huge, the dragon's scaled head lowered, darting in and downward where I had cowered beneath it. Venom and flame dripped from its fangs, huge black eyes glittered and whirled as it sought me. Run, boy! Alan cried. His voice was cracked with his pain, breaking up. There was an edge of desperate fear there. Run, boy! But I could not run. Run to where? A dash forward or to either side would bring the dragon's huge head sweeping after me, fangs bared and seeking the taste of my blood. Where could I run? Power to ban fear, I whispered. I was light with fear and frozen with it, but as I spoke the words I felt a part of me leaving, withdrawing from my body. Even as I realised this, I felt something new enter me, a power and a strange kind of strength, which had nothing to do with strength of limb. It was a kind of strength of heart. I took the deepest breath I could in the dragon reek. Glancing at Alan, who was climbing slowly to his feet, his face was white and strained with fear and pain. He hefted the sword in his left hand, not his sword hand, for that arm was broken and dangling at a sickening angle. Power, he gasped. Power, I said after him. Power for strength, sir. The dragon's head was snaking closer, weaving back and forth now, seeking me in the best way to snatch at me. I'm too near its leg, I realised, for him to risk a clear attack. Aye, and if I was behind the leg, I did not waste time on the thought, but darted behind the huge trunk of the foreleg. In the shadow of his leg and chest, I could hear the rumble of the bellow of rage which was working its way from the cavern in its throat. Strike, my lord, strike now! He did not need me to direct his stroke. There is a place just under the jaw, a tender and vulnerable place where the scales of a dragon's armour do not quite overlap. It was a place that Alan struck, thrusting his sword in with all the strength his left arm possessed. He cried aloud, whether from pain or triumph I could not tell. The stink around us grew and doubled, black blood hissing and steaming as it felt the cool touch of the air ran down the dragon's neck. Get out, boy! And as he needed no instruction from me to strike, I needed no warning from him to flee. The air was filled with death screams, screams which rose higher and louder, filling the air until they were not so much sounds as feelings, not so much heard with the ears but felt in every part of the body and mind. Out from under the bulk of the monster, crouching as close to the ledge of the cliff as I dared, I watched Alan follow up his advantage and strike again and again until the thing, its throat torn, its jugular and bloody shreds, reared a last time, blotting out the sun with the immensity of its bulk, and fell. That fall, that crushing weight, sent me sprawling face forward, retching from the death stench. I looked up, wiping dirt and sickness from my mouth, and saw Alan wiping his sword upon his cloak. He stood, weaving upon legs which seemed about to fail him, caught his balance and looked back at me. Horte killed, he said, his eyes bright in his pain-drawn face. Horte killed, heart's child. The words were soft upon my heart. He staggered, stumbled once and went into the dragon's cave. Heart's child. I did not know how long he was there or what he did, for the thing that I called strength of heart had left me. My legs gave out, and my sight grew dark, and I fainted. He told me he was angry over and over as he wiped my face clean. He told me he would dismiss me, for he had no need of a servant who would not follow orders. I knew he did not mean it, for his ministrations were tender, and his eyes belied all of his words. I helped him down the mountain when we were both steadier, leaving behind us the reek and stink of the dead monster. We did not find our horses until we were nearly a mile from the dragon's mount, when we did, I tore the spare shirt from my pack into strips to bind Alan's arm and form a rude sling. I helped him to mount carefully and led his horse while riding my own. I told him that it was a miracle the animals had not died from fear. He told me it was a miracle I had not died from my own stupidity. And what did I think I was about disobeying his explicit orders? Had we both been killed, who would have gone to the king? Alan looked at me then and shook his head. You do not understand. 
That is certain, my lord. What did you seek in the dragon's lair? He smiled then and reached inside his cloak. He withdrew a small object, no larger than an egg. And from what I could see, it was a jewel, blue in colour and brilliant. But it did not seem valuable enough, as lovely as it was, to risk his life in the taking. He saw my judgment in my eyes. No, it does not look like much, does it? It is beautiful, but no, I cannot think it worth your life, my lord. Alan laughed. I assure you, boy, it is. I assure you that it would be worth the lives of a regiment to recover. But what is it, my lord? What? He tucked the jewel back inside his cloak and pretended surprise at my question. Could you, the great sorcerer that you are, not be aware of what I carry? I'm no sorcerer, my lord, I answered, knowing even then my words could not be true. I only tried to help. He softened then. Aye, you are, boy, and help you did. I caught his meaning and shook my head again. Hope was balanced against fear. I could feel, in memory, the terrible feeling of draining and filling, and that feeling that something I knew nothing about was lending strength to me. I shivered and told him that I only provided the distraction that he needed to kill the beast, but he, he did not agree. There is power in you, boy. The discovery was painful, aye, I know that. But by its discovery, you have saved others such pain. Alan reached out as good hand and lifted my chin, his eyes finding mine and holding them. There was, in his own eyes, a light of satisfaction. But when he spoke, his words were wry and amused. I recognised you, boy. When I first saw you, it took time, though, for you to recognise yourself. And the jewel, my lord? I turned the subject purposefully, not wanting to dwell upon the power and the things it took in exchange. His hand dropped to the place where the jewel lay within his cloak. A key, boy, a simple key. To what, my lord? Why, to treasure, of course. I shook my head again. It seems part of a treasure, not a key. Still, it is a key. It lay in legend as long as it lay in that dragon's hoard. Some said it was real, some said it was a fable. And what does it do? He laughed aloud at that. Silently, he removed the jewel from its place of safety. Put out your hand, boy. Slowly, I did. He dropped the jewel into my palm. It was cool and hard, but even as I thought it so, it began to gleam and grow warm. It took quickly the warmth of a living thing, and I knew that it should not have garnered the warmth of my own body that fast. Startled, I looked up. It is warm, my lord. And see how it glows. Ellen smiled, but it was not a smile of amusement, more one of gratification. He reached for the jewel again and let it sit for a moment in his own hand. It lost none of its glow. This might have told you something many months ago, boy, had we had it then. What, my lord? That you have the power. That you will make a good student. Student? What will I study? Much. It might be that you will teach us as well. We are a much maligned brotherhood, those of us with the power. Tricksters, conjurers, dabblers in evil, they call us. He laughed and it was a bitter sound. But that will change. How? With the help of the king. We will found an order, an order not of sorcerers and tricksters, but of men skilled in magic and of men who would seek the power to be found in truth. It is the king's will? Aye, so it is. It is his mission you have saved, boy, as well as my own life. You will find us both grateful. They will call us tricksters no more, boy. They will call us wise men. Wizards. Alan shifted uncomfortably in his saddle, and I knew that his arm pained him despite the bandage and sling that I had rigged. He gestured with his good hand, and we stopped. He reached across the necks of our horses and placed his hand upon my shoulder. You will be welcomed, boy, by the king. My lord? Aye, you will be. And you will study hard. And you will someday make a fine wizard, boy. I stared at him. There was weariness in his voice and no prophecy. He spoke his words not in faith, but from some sure knowledge. I? A wizard? I? Part of a respected order? I wonder what lay ahead to transform a thief and a servant into a wizard. But if he did not speak in faith, it was I who accepted in faith and in love. That day, I was content to simply travel with him. It took us more than a month of journeying to reach the court of the king, during that time, we stopped in the villages and towns, listened to the gossip, and healed. 
His great treasure he kept close to him, never letting it go from the safety of its place in his cloak. It was upon that stone that our order was founded, but it was not upon that stone that my own faith was founded. The base of my faith was Alan. I saw not in those days the founding of orders, I saw only the beginning of a new place for me. And glimmering and new to me, I caught through his eyes, and soon through my own, glimpses of my own soul. The soul I had feared that he would take, the soul he had given to me. Many have come after me, many have loved him as I did. For ever did he aspire the love of those souls he sought to uncover. I've watched in wonder and joy as he bought, one by one, slowly and carefully, the many boys into our order who gave to it its strength and respected status. For me, however, those who came later were merely repetitions of the miracle that visited me that long ago day. For I, once a thief, lately a servant, was that day a wizard's boy.